All right. I know we have, um, and certainly everybody's going to have a lot of questions. There were some comments that I wanted to, to make before we got into this. I think there were some really interesting uh, presentations, and I think it really opened up um, to look at a really broad spe spectrum of um, engaging in terms of Native art, the different institutions, how individuals, and also, you know, shamelessly to try to tie it back to the exhibition, Connections Across Generations. Um, I think it was very interesting to note that a number of the speakers did address issues of connections, bridges, voices, um, how to, uh, you know, strategies for teaching students how to find voice, their own voice. Um, you know, Mark in talking about the role of the dealer, you know, to what extent does the dealer, the collector, and the museum play in, in you know, creating a, a space for a native voice or in silencing that? I think there were some really interesting issues resolved or <coughs> relating to that. Um, <coughs> comments that I had. I've been making diligent notes for, for all of these. Um, so I think, you know, as we get off the couple, get, get the dialogue going here, one of the things that I wanted to start off with is to, to, you know, start with Truman, pick on him first. Um, one particularly about Hauser and Morrison, um, do you to them as the focus for starting off the exhibitions for NMAI? <laughs> well, I think that if you look at um, one of the things, in fact, it was part of my interview when I interviewed for the position um, at the uh, NMEI. That was one of their questions. Who would you exhibit first? <clears throat> and being an educator, one of the things that you got to do is you, you have to bring everyone along. So I thought I wanted to put the most prominent people, or the most prominent artists that I am aware of, that, that, would, that would not only appeal to a broad audience uh, across the country, not only native, but also non-native. And and the, the reason for the choice is that you, it, you could actually flip that as well, so that the natives became more aware of who the natives are, and the non-natives could become much more aware of uh, the native artists. So it's, it's, it's in, and I think these artists, these two artists really break a lot of boundaries. And the boundaries that, that they broke we have to keep in mind, they did it within their own lifetime, and that's the most crucial. I think oftentimes it's, it's too bad that the museum wasn't built before when they were still alive, because I think it would, it would, it would even be much more uh, crucial to have them and their voices there. But I think they will be there when you see the when you see the exhibition and when you see the range of work that these two artists did, it was it's phenomenal, it's incredible. They were, they were basically boundless. So that was really the, the reason for selecting. Do we have any questions from the audience? Um, this would go to um, Mr. Lowe and Mr. Baker. How does it feel to be, each of you are producing artists, and yet you are in a position to constantly hold out other people's work, in a sense, putting your work in the background? What's it like being in, having the jobs that you both have, and yet having professionally the responsibility to put other artists out there for other people. What's that like? Well, I think from uh, speaking just for myself, I think it's really the idea of, especially with Morrison Hauser, it's it's really the the respect that I have for them. It's easy to do. Um, I think for 
the uh, continuum uh, 12 artists that will be exhibiting in, at uh, Gustav High Center. What it is is that these are my colleagues who I have lived and worked with through my, my creative time. And I feel that they really need, um, they, I want to make them better known. Uh, I think as a curator, that I feel that that's part of my responsibility, is at this particular time in their lives, uh, they're, they're not as old as I am, um, but I think that, that they've, they've been working, it's almost like they've been working underground, but they have established their, their, their particular work, their particular style, it's, it's, it's there, it's complete, but I think the audience needs to be broadened, and I think that's, that's what I can do at, at this museum. Speaking for myself, I think it's a, an opportunity um, and a responsibility as an artist um, to create opportunities for new thought and to support artists. Um, I, think it's, um, I think it's really a privilege. Um, it's a privilege in the sense that as curator, um, it reflects an artist's eye. I think that's very important and much needed um, in our world today. Artists see the world differently, and I think that they can um, help expand common knowledge and understanding and, and create energy and excitement um, within, the, within the institution. Thank you for a very rich day of ideas and images. I was very interested in Genevieve Heal's comments at the outset about the continuity of traditional Native arts and setting those in contrast to today's work, which was wonderful. I'm wondering, uh, given that the Arizona State Museum has had a, a history of dealing with traditional Native arts, and this is groundbreaking, um, direction for us to be moving in now. I'm wondering if any of you, and this is not a question specifically for any individual, would brainstorm how we might engineer an exchange of those artists who represent the traditional continuum and those artists who represent the contemporary fine arts that we've been talking about today. How can you envision a conference, a meeting, a symposium, an exchange of elders and youngers uh, what, where would your thoughts go on that issue? Well, since everybody else is chicken, I, <laughs> <laughs> I am a museum person, and I was at the Smithsonian for uh, uh, eight years, um, running the Native American public programs there. Um, one of the things that I found uh, was really important to the artists that we presented was that intergenerational connection between the older artists, whether they were contemporary traditionalists or if they were uh, young um, practitioners of art that, that had not even been uh, defined yet. And within Native communities, uh, one of the things that I've seen is to provide the space for that kind of uh, uh, interaction to happen. Um, you know, and in a museum setting, sometimes you're, you're, uh, you have to find the place to do it. You know, we don't always have like a, a great setting like this. But um, at, at one point, we, we literally had um, a Lakota quilt maker who was doing a demonstration just happened. There was a quilting conference on in Washington, D.C. Um, one of the quilters happened to be in the hall at uh, Natural History, saw this young woman who designed her quilt uh, on computer. 
and this was in 1991, they went back, told all the, uh, the quilters that there was this um, Plains quilter. They all came, brought their quilts. They all sat down in the middle of the hall, and they just started exchanging information. Totally just sat down in the hall. It wasn't even a formal uh, uh, anything planned, but what it, what it was was spontaneous, and it was, it was the ability to share that information between themselves, not only as quilters, but as women within an age group. They just made the space, you know. Um, we're asked all the time at the casino if we can, uh, uh, if people can use it, and we have, um, we have uh, sponsored the uh, Atlal conference receptions. We've sponsored, uh, we're going to sponsor the Native American Art Studies Association. We're going to be involved with that. Um, one of the things is, uh, I make that casino recognize that it has the arts and that it's their responsibility to be involved with Native art. Um, and, and not just in a monetary way, but to, to provide the space, the resources, the staff, the time. Um, you just sometimes lead the horse to water. Well, and I think that there are a number of institutions and organizations that exist. Um, Alita pointed out, too, out loud on the Native Arts Network and NASA, the Native American Art Studies Association, both of which, and I don't remember, is out loud annually or every two years? Every two years. So both of them um, you know, have a conference every two years. The next conference for NASA, I know, is going to be um, hosted up at Arizona State University in Phoenix, and it'll be this October. I'm not sure when the next out loud. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm thinking, you know, I'm wishfully thinking, Kate, 2004, Salem, yeah, I guess, you know, Salem will be this year, uh, Salem, Massachusetts, 2004 or five it is, we're 2005, we're in ASU, I guess I'm wanting it to be in Arizona already. So, um, but in, in looking at this, there are different organizations that exist in which people engage in this continuity or, or exchange between um, different types of artistic practice among Native artists, but also I think Alita's key point is looking at institutions or other places that create a space for this and also in how it works within um, a community dynamic you know because because whether or not somebody is working mostly within uh, a community context versus really being in, engaged and involved in an external uh, market makes a big difference and I would also argue that NMAI's structure and mission is to at some level to facilitate a space for people to come together and do this. And so I think there's been a lot of um, interest in museums to reevaluate how they function within society. What are, the, what are their roles as an institution? Certainly, you know, Truman talked at length about the public programs as being a vital aspect of NMAI. And I know a number of institutions, I know Arizona State Museum has really tried to use their public programs as a way of um, not only educating, but creating a space or a place for communities to come together and interact. So I think as museums are starting to change and other institutions are starting to change, not just as exhibition spaces, but more as living museums, this creates more of a dialogue. Well, I think also in regards to how you can create those connections and that continuum between fine arts and traditional craft and contemporary art, um, you know, the museum has rich resources in terms of materials and people. Maybe what needs to be done is starting from of uh, exploring the possibility that those categories, fine art, traditional craft, and contemporary art, uh, might not be categories so much as points of view. And then revisit those areas. As an example, um, pulling out contemporary thong out and basketry, I mean, by contemporary, what's being done currently, um, juxtaposing it with work that uh, people like Terrell Johnson are doing. And then going back perhaps to the, the um, archaeological collections where you have the earliest transition from plainware corrugated to painted pottery and looking at innovation and what contemporary might be in, um, in that context and creating the ground where uh, practitioners of all those three, what we look at those three classifications, 
can begin talking about how they do their work and then let them lead the, uh, lead the direction to the next step. I guess I'll say that uh, often people think that uh, the contemporary art is so different from the traditional um, and having worked with different students and knowing um, the, a lot of contemporary artists, a lot of them do know a lot of their traditional ways and a lot of their work is inspired by the time that they spend at home in those traditional spaces. So that's one thing that people, um, I guess we need to educate ourselves and the general public about is that just because some of the artists may d be doing contemporary work, it's, it's not that be they're disconnected from their communities. It's almost like they're even more so connected because they're drawing from that um, rich history. Um, and another thing that that brings up is a question that I was asked by uh, a non-native person on the East Coast. He's, had written me a letter and said, no, you know, I hear you're up in Boise, Idaho, and when are you going to go back to your community and be in your community? And, you know, there are indigenous people who <laughs> are known as, you know, so-and-so from this Pueblo or so-and-so from this, and you should be doing that. And I think some of us that are doing things outside of, you know, the reservation um, are touching on larger issues, and I think that's really important, too. Just as an aside, you know, something that, that, that your comment brought up, um, probably every Native person with, a, with an undergraduate degree on up is, has been told by someone, you know, this is great that you're getting a degree, and we'll go back to your Native, your home community. Now, I went to school at Prescott College, and my professor up there never once said, you know, this would be wonderful if you get your degree and go back to your home community of Tucson and help your fellow Tucsonians. But I think that is an issue that you know, what we, you know, that has been, um, you know, talked about indirectly in this day's discussions. You know, the kind of um, restrictions, categories, um, limitations at times that are put on Native artists that aren't, you know, aren't there, those kind of categories or restrictions aren't there for other artists. And I think, I, if I remember correctly, I think maybe it was Alita who was talking about, um, you know, somebody was, one of, one of the speakers talked about a story about, you know, are you a native artist or an artist or how do you see yourself? And those are these kind of, those issues as well. And I think that, um, I, you know, I was uh, with Halea's uh, discussion, the notion of coding. You know, I think that all, all art that's being produced has codes to it, has coding to it. And it's what we bring. You know, I would argue that it's a notion of different types of literacy. Um, cultural, historical, political, social, linguistic. I mean, because also some of the things that came out today too relate, relate with or relate to issues of language and play on language. And those kind of things are there too. But, you know, unfortunately, because of the way that Native art was marketed at the, um, you know, at the turn of the 20th century, the mid 1800s, we've, we've had this different kind of focus um, on a construction of Indianness that has had its legacy in 20th century artistic production. In terms of some of the things that people have discussed about identity, um, about you know, outdated questions like what is Native American art, um, and th those kind of things limit, as I think our, as uh, Truman was arguing, that they limit the, the look or the discussion of where we go from here. This has been an inspiring afternoon, uh, really. We've seen a, a tremendous spectrum of uh, art all the way from traditional art to multimedia art to paintings to photography. Um, so coming back to the questions that are in the program, what directions will American Indian artists take? I think it's been answered, namely all directions, all technologies, all materials, invoking traditional art, invoking new materials, etc. cetera. Uh, what are the issues surrounding Native arts, creative expression and acceptance of those works by others? Not bloody much, I would say, because there are so many creative Indian artists that I know. They're sophisticated, they're urban, they understand their traditions, they use technology. They can't make enough for the sophisticated collectors that I think Body was talking about 
evidence being people want to know the name and who they are. So uh, I thank you. Uh, I have several questions and one other question um, that I have is uh, where are the uh, upcoming you know curators and critics and um, coming from and, and what are well some of your teaching and so forth and then also audience where the audience you had talked about uh, uh, some of the exciting directions that the younger Native American uh, artists are, are, are pursuing, but the audience, look, look at who's in this room. I mean, how is the audience going to change? Is the audience going to change? And also, um, is this video going to be on the web? Uh, the video needs to be on the web and it needs to be everywhere. So people will click on it and educate themselves. So. The, well, I think that the, the, the younger generation that's coming up, the younger artists and the younger writers, I mean, that they're out there. It's just that, you know, they, they have to be given a chance because you know, we have a lot of old school in, in positioning. And, you, you, and when you have to fight old school, you know, it's like, um, I mean, well, it's, it's a, it falls in line with the whole patronage thing falls in line with clicks, it falls in line with who's in, who's out, who's it, who's this, who's that, um, um, who's your friend? And it is friends, you know, um, how did you get here? You know, so I know so and so. So hopefully, you know, a lot of the old school is going to help the young school come up because that, that's, that's the way we're going to have to do it and not be scared of them. Because sometimes, Sometimes old school is like, uh-uh. <laughs> yeah. But there's some, there's some really beautiful writers and there's some really beautiful artists. And, and like I said, you know, w when I get tired of looking in books or looking at museum catalogs or things like that, because it's the same old artists over and over and over, uh, I go to the web. And there's those young artists. And they're, and they're, not, being, they're not being like told that you can't do this or that. They're putting it on. Maybe this young girl's into goth. You know, she's, she's doing her whole goth thing, you know? It, you know, maybe somebody else, um, there's a, I know there's, oh, I can't remember his site, but it's something about spaceships and fry breads, and he has like <laughs> all these writings on, on, on you know, it, it's beautiful. But, but as for the video, um, it's good. Um, I'm gonna be having some installations where it's at, and then we're, uh, Veronica and I are, are working on a new web page. Uh, hopefully, it'll be up in about a month and a half. It'll be hoya.com. But um, ju and just to throw out another .com, uh, zonezero.com. Pedro Mayer. It's one of my favorite uh, places to visit on the web. Uh, photographs, it's just beautiful photographs everywhere from everybody. Um, yeah, that's a beautiful place. Educators really need this as well because they're looking for it, and so maybe the state museum can um, do something with the program and put out an educator's toolkit or something. Yeah, I mean, up updating, updating ones, because one of, one of the things that happens with artists is like you know they don't get senile, they get outdated, you know. <laughs> And so you, you got, you got, you know, it's like, you know, you're, you're still referring to the 60s like it was, you know, five years ago. <laughs> the students are going, Malcolm who? <laughs> you know? It's like, they're like, oh, man. That's so true. Like, you know, you know your old win or outdated win. Your pop cultural references are like old Nick at Nights. Yeah, and you say, oh, who are the Jetsons? Like, well, Flash Gordon. I was trying to make com you know commentary about the old black and white Flash Gordons and you know racial designations and things like this. You know, so it is. It's yeah. So everybody has to update. I mean, everybody has to update because I mean, like you know, you got to keep you got to keep up the slice of time, this t moment that's eternity right now. You know, and if you do that, if you don't do that, you're you're you know, crawl in it. Yeah. But I think one of the things that becomes I think. Melanie, 
But one of the things that I think a number of you have touched on is the role that travel has played for you and that many of you, you know, are, are, are interested and committed to working globally. Um, and that those alliances, you know, that what you're saying, Halea, about friends and it's having that connection, you know, you, you um, both you and Melanie had wonderful discussions about how you've made connections with a number of people and maybe not necessarily artists per se, but that it's also making community connections about things that are, are important to you. Um, you know, I, you've been involved in a number of important graphic uh, product uh, productions that you talked about, the Hope Project, et cetera. And it's wonderful to think about, too, the kind of connections that you've made with other women in particular, because especially in some of the examples that you talked about, um, I think it was down in Peru, where the women were working on some really just simply fundamental day-to-day -day issues that, you know, we can sit and talk about um, what's happening in the last part of the 20th century in terms of native artistic production and whether or not art is aesthetic or political or whatever. But when you get down to it, that, that particular image you showed of you being in that community with those women and their, their one objective is milk and bread for kids. I mean, that's a profound statement about, you know, what kind of impact day to day things make. And, and then also how, um, how you are all working at, at, you know, at that moment, the day to day kind of moment, and then also seeing things in a larger global connection and using um, your creativity, your intellect, and your ability to you know, pull all these things together to open up people's eyes to see how there's larger connections. Um, I'd like to go back to, to the subject of audience. We at the Heard Museum have the reputation of being the old pop museum. Um, and that might apply to other institutions that may well be represented in this room today. Um, but you know, I think, we wor I think we worry it too much. I think we think about it too much. I think we talk about it too much. I think the way to affect change is to just do it. And I think if we trust in the process and we support artists, uh, we, we will uh, be able to affect change. I think we spend a lot of time worrying the stone. And uh, we spend less time uh, investing um, energy in, in, in creative ventures that make things happen. We're, uh, it's time for action. Uh, we, we've been talking for a long time, and now it's simply time to act. It's so damn simple. <laughs> One of the things I noticed uh, today when I came, there was a flyer out that had some of the poetry writers from our school. <laughs> Go see them. <laughs> Yep, and one of the things about uh, where are these young up and coming people, they're out there, and um, it's one of the reasons why I choose to stay in education, because it's really exciting to see the new blood coming up. And, um, and like she said, one of our old alumni from the Institute is doing poetry, Sher uh, Sherwin is here doing that, and there are different ones that are out there. Uh, Shauna Sunrise has opened her own um, website and also like a little cable company in Albuquerque. Um, and they're starting to come out of the woodwork and it's really exciting. Um, I know at times when we see different ones, you know, we call each other on the phone or email and say, gosh, you know, we could just sit back now because they're going to take off. <laughs> so they're out there and it's really um, an exciting time. Um, one of the things you asked was about uh, where the new uh, critics and writers, uh, historians were coming from, and uh, uh, Smithsonian for a long time has had American Indian uh, internships, fellowships, uh, community scholars uh, who come to the institution have access to the five museum collections that contain Native American materials, and one of the things NM NMAI has been doing is promoting that more. Um, but there's also four other museums that have those collections and accesses. And um, the, the thing with um, uh, where are these critics coming from, um, 
uh, critical writing is so important to the field of art history. And as an art historian, um, you just don't pick it up. You have to learn how to write academically. And, uh, and you learn how to write academically because you choose the field to be an academic. And um, one of the problems has been is uh, with Native American art history in particular, is there has not been the critical writing because there has not been the art historians who can critically write. So um, one of the things that has been very uh, detrimental to Native art being recognized is the fact that uh, um, if you are a Native historian and you cannot write in that academic style, you don't get your articles into Art News and Art in America and Art Journal. Um, well, that's a, that's a bias, and, but that's the practice of the field. So what do you do? Well, on Thursdays I write like an academic, and on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday I write like a normal person. You know, so, so that versatility has to be there, and also the desire that you want to become part of that field. Um, and, and that's what Smithsonian has been doing so well, is helping these uh, young people who have an interest in museums, who want to work in an institution, who want to be curators and critics and art historians to have access to the materials where they can see them and work with them and then work with some of the top scholars in the world. I think more and more, um, as more programs come up, and as more P students are produced from these programs like UNM, like University of Washington, and now the University of Arizona is making a financial commitment to having this kind of program, that's where you're gonna have it. Because if there aren't, if you know, my fundamental problem when I started graduate school 10 more years ago, um, was that there really weren't very many places to even go. You know, so if you have an interest, where do you go? How do you, how do you craft yourself? And for myself, I had to spin it as 20th century American, focusing on issues of race, class, gender, and ethnicity was my little shtick. And that, cause that's the way I could fit into a traditional department. But you know, these are, these kind of things are changing and, and for the good. And as Alita has pointed out, there are institutions that have supported um, people along the way. That, that were, that are happening uh, in, at the um, Gustav High Center um, I really tried to make, uh, create an avenue for such individuals because I know that there are, there are individuals out there who are, who are working, who are working at this and I really wanted to somehow highlight that. So in addition to the regular kind of publicity that will come out on the exhibitions, uh, a brochure, a very elegant brochure, um, also invitations uh, accompanying the exhibitions. And thirdly, we, we have been working with a number of Native students who are working on PhDs in, in art history. And they are, we, we're involved in, with them in trying to create a critical essay about each particular artist, and uh, the essay is only a thousand words long, but I think it's an avenue in which we're trying to generate, uh, trying to get the pub get their publications started in that process. So, and there aren't that many out there, and we continually lo are looking. So, if you see anyone out there, let us know, because I think this is. This is, you know, this is, this is an avenue in which um, young writers, uh, especially art historians, art critics, can, can really begin to explore and, we'll, you know, we're helping them in, in this process as well. So, thanks. I think also you'll find in Tucson, and U of H specifically, but Tucson General, has been really um, and continues to be a, a great place to nurture um, directions in art uh, for young Native students. Um, there's just out now is a new edition of Dancing in the Wind, which is produced by a group here in town that, uh, that encourages young Native writers in the elementary school to begin thinking about writing, to think about poetry, and each edition is, is edited by a prominent Native writer. Um, 
you know, there's some really great opportunities, and it needs to begin at, at that level. People, you know, kids need to know they have those possibilities uh, at that age. The other two things I just want to throw out rhetorically just to kind of stir things up and then I'll, <laughs> then I'll bail. Um, I'm wondering what how people both in the audience and on the panel and artists feel. You go into an exhibit of contemporary or modern Native American art and it always lists tribal affiliation. Is that useful? Is that helpful? Is there a point to it? You know, you go and I'll see Anishinaabe there and I know I can find them on the map, but that's, you know, pretty much the end of the reference point for me. Is it, um, you know, is there a point to listing that in the type of art that we've been talking about here today? And the second thing I want to mention is in terms of critical thinking and, and critiquing, I hear the word critic and criticize in there also, that's an element of it. And yet, um, perhaps because it's a, a smaller field, uh, perhaps because it's so tied in with the, the marketing end of things where, where I sit and, and, um, and make my living, critical criticizing isn't something that's generally well received in any of the, the arenas, uh, whether it's in writing or in reviews or um, or in, in shows, the closer they come to it is perhaps in judging, but it's sort of, even that, um, it isn't truly that, because you're selecting the best, not saying this needs work or that isn't suitable necessarily. Um, and so I wonder how people feel about that element, whether that exists, whether that needs to be there, whether that would help lift um, the discussion or not. Tribal identification? It's a big issue. It's a big issue um, as it applies to new work and new thought. Um, having spent um, a year at the Institute of American Indian Arts and, and spent quite a lot of time with students, um, I found that student voice was challenging, that concept. Um, however, that's a kind of fire that comes when you're young. Uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that you have, uh, you're, you're, on, you're exploring. It doesn't necessarily mean that you have the full understanding of who you are uh, and what your place is in the world and what responsibilities um, uh, are yours. So I support tribal identification. I, um, I realize that, that there's, on one side, they're saying no. Uh, I want to be mainstream. I want to be identified as an artist. I want to um, not be identified as native. That's important to me. But on the other hand, um, it really, in my opinion, it's only my personal opinion, it is important to identify. Um, you, you're, you're, not just, you, you're not just representing yourself. You're not just, uh, as an artist, um, uh, you, you really you know, are reflecting your community and you are representing all of your people. And what, what, what's wrong with uh, standing up and owning that? I think it's important. Well, unfortunately, I think we have gone over the time and, and are needing to vacate the facility. But we were, um, Harman, did you want to? Um, I think Harman's going to invite us all over. But hopefully, we can continue this uh, dialogue over at the Arizona State Museum. I'd like to thank the panelists for their many, many contributions this afternoon and many, many contributions throughout their career. And wish you the best in your future as you shape the future. I'd like to also thank you all for your kind attention and see you at the reception. <laughs>